Great. Well, yeah, I want to make sure we have plenty of time if we do uh, have a little discussion at the end. I think um, um, that's always good to have in uh, these kinds of meetings. There's a lot of good ideas out there, a lot of good experience. So we like to capture all as much of that as we can. So um, thank you. Um, so uh, today um, I'm Justin Meissen. I'm the Research Restoration Program Manager here at the Tallgrass Prairie Center. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about how the choices that farmers make when deciding um, what season to plant CRP seed mixes, um, how that influences how successful those uh, plantings turn out to be. Um, and so this is a, a talk based on um, manuscript master's thesis that uh, uh, Alec Glidden is a grad student, uh, a former grad student here at the University of Northern Iowa uh, did. So he's also uh, one to uh, thank when it comes to this. Um, so, you know, of course, we all know land use intensification, rising production inputs, continue to diminish our ecosystem services and, and ag landscapes throughout Iowa, throughout the country, um, reduce pollinator abundance, deteriorate water quality. These are all large scale stressors facing our ecosystems. Um, so in response, um, you know, a lot of organizations have uh, developed targeted programs to address uh, some of those specific conservation challenges. So one of our largest examples in the US and Iowa is the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP as we'll call it for the rest of the uh, talk. Um, and that creates a lot of conservation practices designed to enhance specific ecosystem services. You know, historically, the implementation of these programs has been really quite simplistic with respect to the kinds of plants and animal, uh, plants used for revegetation. Um, you know, using more than a handful of species, let alone native species, uh, for revegetation was not really that common in the past. But more recently, you know, we're seeing these programs take on more complex issues uh, with aspects of ecosystem rehabilitation. Uh, included in their targets. Uh, so, you know, more and more of these uh, revegetation projects are being deployed and they're being, uh, they're requiring diverse native vegetation. So as CRP has filled that role, you know, it's become a significant driver for native seed markets. Um, you know, if you browse a lot of the websites of uh, a lot of the folks out here uh, currently and today, um, you know, you always see that there's they're providing native seed mixes for popular seed uh, CRP programs. Um, and with those offerings, that means that we're seeing thousands of acres at the least going out on egg landscapes. And, uh, you know, especially as we talked about the uh, pollinator rollout in 2017, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres in a couple of years. And, you know, that's really significant. So given how popular uh, CRP using uh, you know, diverse native vegetation has become, these kind of practices have a lot of potential to be widely adopted, uh, especially by folks without any experience planting native vegetation. So given the potential for so many uh, of these native, uh, these new adopters, um, it's important to ensure they can succeed with their first experience, since that's gonna help us secure long-term buy-in or uh, expansion of practices. So because many farmers and landowners are new to establishing native vegetation, ultimately have to rely on secondhand forms of info like uh, practice implementation guidelines. And those guidelines really do need to have strong scientific backing before we can uh, really feel confident about recommending them um, and expecting uh, successful outcomes to result from that. So of the methods and design choices that are important when implementing um, you know, CRP, uh, the timing of seeding is towards the top of the list as a factor both able to determine ecological performance and really importantly, something that's relatively easy to implement. So a lot of things that we talk about are theoretically really good ideas, but once you really think about how do we get someone who's not had a lot of experience doing prairie restoration to do it, then it becomes a bit more of a challenge. Uh, you know, most prairie constructions are seeded either during the spring, you know, April to June, or in the dormant season, somewhere in November to March. Uh, 
And for, for many species, particularly forbs, you know, I think we all mostly know that cold moist stratification for 30 to 60 to 90 days is a requirement to break dormancy and germinate. Um, now, while most uh, conditions for dormancy breaking are met when you're doing a dormant planting, it's going to be rare to meet those um, uh, conditions in growing season plantings. But because those seeds are exposed for longer periods of time with dormant plantings, you know, that also means there's an opportunity for predation and seed loss. So, you know, there's potential for things to go either way. Um, Interestingly, there's a really big disconnect in the techniques used between farmers who are planting CRP, conservation professionals and from NGOs and government, um, at least on some of the non-scientific um, surveys we've done as part of our other work with uh, CP42 pollinator plantings. Um, you know, farmers are planting April through June 86% of the time. So pretty much all of these pollinator plantings are spring seeded. On the other hand, um, there's a study done um, back in 2010 who looked at NGOs, government plantings, or government folks like um, TNC, Fish and Wildlife. Um, those managers are using dormant seeding overwhelmingly when they're planting prairie. So is one way better than the other? And what are the implications of this? So our objective was to figure out um, how season of planting influences establishment success and a couple key metrics, vegetation density, biodiversity, and pollinator resources in the context of popular CRP um, seed mixes. Um, so Alec Glidden, a uh, grad student, as I was saying, uh, he was uh, able to submit uh, an author manuscript to Restoration Ecology, so hopefully I can be able to uh, present that to you some, some time down the road once it's published. So to understand the effects of timing of seeding on prairie, uh, uh, prairie plantings and CRP, different kinds of CRP seed mixes, um, we initiated a field experiment in 2018 that looked at two planting season treatments um, where we planted in the dormant season on November 15th, so that's for the opening day for uh, CRP to be planted in the fall. And uh, in the spring, the next April, late April, April 28th, 2019. Um, so this was also set up to test some other things um, related to typical um, management choices in CRP, um, but we're not gonna be able to get into that, even though those are also interesting results. Um, and we can talk about it in our discussion. Um, but uh, so some things to, to, to take into account. So these, these common seed mixes, these practices that we're talking about today, um, CP42, pollinator habitat, um, basically looking at these grass to forb ratios, so um, uh, forb dominated uh, pollinator mix. Um, this one was a premium mix, um, as it turned out, even though it was based on the, one of the first pollinator mixes that went out. Um, CP43 prairie strips, so um, that's sort of a balanced approach. We're trying to um, get all the benefits of a you know, tall grass prairie. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the things from the pollinator planting uh, framework, but also into, uh, you know, we want to have plenty of grass too. So it's a balanced seed mix um, and it's very diverse in this particular uh, mix that we used. And that's uh, looking more like Christine's, you know, um, diversity mix in terms of price. So it's, it's fairly, it's up there for a producer. And then we also looked at a, a cheaper grass dominated seed mix that's fairly representative of a CP25 or a, um, a rare and declining habitat. So. Uh, that one was 123 and these are all of this year's prices, by the way. So um, let's look at the results here. Um, so first thing we're going to do, we're, we're going to focus on native plant density. Um, so stems, the actual number of stems per square meter, or the average, uh, we're looking at the average of year one and year two. Um, so we're going to break out plant density by some of the functional groups. Um, 
Graminoids and Forbes, and then we're further going to go and break it out by uh, phenological groups, or basically blooming time, because that is a very important thing when we're talking about pollinators, and also for for general ecological function. Having plants, you know, growing at one time of the year is important to have throughout the year. So now we're here. We're going to look at uh, how native grasses are affected by planting time. Um, on the y-axis, we're looking at stems per square meter, and warm season, cool season, and the combined groups on the uh, x-axis. So if you see stars on that, that means that's a statistically significant difference. Um, and what we see here is that grasses, um, you know, when you plant in the spring, you get higher abundance of warm season grasses, sort of at the expense of cool season grasses and sedges, and the opposite uh, happens uh, when you plant in the dormant season. You get more cool season grasses and sedges at the expense of the warm season grasses. And interestingly enough, if you were to only look at grasses, you wouldn't see a difference. So you really do have to think about this, um, think about these results in terms of the, the phenology of the species. So now let's look at the forbs. Similar graph here. We're seeing forb stems per square meter on the y-axis uh, and different forb functional groups on the x-axis. And here we're seeing a range of responses. You know, when we're planting in the dormant season, we get more spring and fall forbs, uh, but we do find more legumes when we plant in the spring. Interestingly, for the most abundant group, the summer forbs, I think, you know, we're all very familiar with those, the retibid, uh, 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 Great-headed coneflower, um, black-eyed Susan. Um, uh, sorry, I have to translate my scientific names to common names. I'm getting, I'm getting. Uh, it's harder and harder to do. Um, Narda, we all, we all know Minarda. Um, and again, when we looked at overall forb density, you, you don't really see a difference. So it, it is, you know, we're seeing these differences in these important groups, but not necessarily overall. Okay, for the next two graphs, we're going to start bringing in that data from the other two treatments, um, but we still want to focus on the season of planting. So we're looking at dormant season planting with the triangles and uh, spring planting with the circles. Um, sort of tangentially, these are with sort of best practice management, so we're mowing these um, every uh, for the first year. So these are kind of the, you know, if you were to, to do a, Prairie reconstruction, you know, that what we would recommend, and that's um, that's kind of what we're looking at here. Even though we can talk about what uh, uh, that later. Um, so yeah, focus on the difference between the triangles and the circles. On the y-axis, we're looking here at species richness and uh, seed mix again on the x-axis. So what we see here is we get a lot more species with dormant seeding. And that's particularly pronounced in the right two seed mixes, which are the uh, diversity mix or the prairie strips mix and the uh, pollinator mix or the CP42 mix. And we see that uh, planting time for the CP25 mix, less important um, when you have that grass dominated uh, low form diversity mix. So let's look at floral resources. Um, so this is, we have a flowering forb species present. So this is more of a frequency basis that we're looking at flowering on the y-axis and then again, seed mix on the x. Similar trend as we did uh, see with the species richness, but even more pronounced. Um, really big benefit of dormant seeding on floral richness. Up to around uh, about twice as many flowering species uh, in the dormant planted plots compared, compared to the spring planted ones. However, if we just look at the density, so just how many flowers are out there, um, we don't really see an, a big impact of seeding time on the actual abundance of flowers. So that's telling us that um, there's still a lot of flowers out there, regardless. Okay, so we found four groups that had a variety of responses to seeding time. Um, how do individual species respond? So um, this is a little new analysis here, um, looking at 
how individual species, uh, whether they produced more stems over the first three years of the planting. Um, and that, that's 30 years of a CRP contract. So that's 30 years, 30% 30 of a CRP contract. So that's really quite significant if you think about that. Um, and, and so uh, we're, we're um, looking to see whether individual species produce more stems over that if they were planted in dormant versus spring uh, planted. So here's a table of the responses. And these are in order from how commonly they're planted in general in CRP mixes. So they should all be very familiar to us in this room. Um, so generally, again, we found a, a variety of responses. So about a third of them did better with dormant seeding. Um, a quarter of them did better with spring seeding. And 40% you know, about had no difference. So interestingly, we see our commonly seeded spring and fall species. Um, you know, Golden Alexander, Stiff Goldenrod, uh, Heath Aster, those are all doing better in the fall when we're planting in the in dormant season, um, and as well as Golden Alexander. Um, but the summer species, you know, either they're performing about the same or they're uh, doing better when they're seeded in the spring. So um, classic species, like I said, um, black-eyed Susan, wild bergamot, yellow coneflower, they're performing just as well when we're seeding a dormant versus spring planting. So if we look at grasses now, um, the only ones that did better with dormant seeding were sedges. Um, by and large, the warm season grasses do better when planted in the spring, especially little blue stem, switchgrass, and Indian grass. Um, but interestingly, side oats and big blue stem didn't really seem to have um, be particularly affected by seeding time. Uh, other species like Canada wild rye and June grass, uh, they weren't affected when we looked at stems over three years. But if you look earlier, um, which is the, some of those grass we looked at, there was a difference there. But once we add in the third year, uh, especially I think we all know that uh, Canada wild rye does well no matter what. So, so to, to sort of summarize all this, um, you know, seasoning of planting influences establishment success. We have more species, floral diversity with dormant planting. Um, we have uh, more spring, fall flowering forbs, cool season graminoids. Uh, but in spring, we have more legumes and more season grasses. Bottom line, I think, is that both methods do create viable stands, but you get more benefits when you do a dormant seeding. Um, so what does that mean for, for those of us in policy and management? Um, I think a lot of us know this sort of um, intuitively if, we, if we've been doing prairie restoration, but you know, diverse mixes, pollinator mixes, they should be seeded in the dormant season. Um, you get high quality pollinator habitat all growing season long, and you know, now we can put some numbers to that. Um, you know, if we're planting a warm season uh, grass or legume heavy mix, that's probably going to perform better in the spring. Um, you know, of course that's going to have pretty limited pollinator use as a as habitat, but it does have utility for wildlife cover. And I think what this tells us is that we're going to have work to do in shifting some of the current farmer practices to adopt to more um, dormant seeding. Uh, practices. So there's clearly a fairly um, standardized uh, way of doing things out there in the Iowa CRP landscape and um, we'll have to figure out ways to um, help them adapt to get uh, more uh, higher quality pollinator habitat out there. Because the existing practice as we, uh, as we see it is probably not going to promote a whole lot of spring and fall pollinator habitat. So um, so that's that's my uh, that's my presentation for today. Um, want to thank all my collaborators and funders for the project, um, and that's all I've got. So, any questions or comments or uh, experience? You know, I think a lot of us have done this kind of work, and I would love to hear what your thoughts are on um, on this. Yeah, just. 
quickly, there's a big difference between the dormant seedings in November and the dormant seedings in March. So the DNR, most of our plantings are done in March in the kind of that shoulder season. So I wonder how much of those benefits we're capturing and if you kind of made note of all the studies you looked at, if they were seeded in March versus November, that sort of thing. Yeah, we, we don't have, I know of zero studies who've actually looked at like a frost seeding. So um, probably because it can be hard to <laughs> actually do it as planned. <laughs> So um, that was one of the reasons we did it in November because it's, it's usually dry enough to get out there and, and seed something. Um, so, so yeah, so there's definitely going to be some variation, I think. Um, are you thinking, what would you say those, those differences would, uh, would be from a November to a, a March planting? amount of time that that seed is able mm -hmm. to be in the ground and go right. through the cold, moist, you know, the whole winter process. So like in March, it's depending on the year. One year, we might get a few more days of freezing and thawing versus, mm -hmm. you know, a previous year, it's already springtime, right. you know, when that planting's done in March. So as far as like what it looks like, I guess I don't even pay enough attention to say this was seeded in you know, February, and it looks so much better than this one that was seeded two weeks later in March. Right. So it's just interesting, those small differences. You know, I would love to know more. So. Yes, me too. I would, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of, there's still, yeah, there's still work to be done in, in kind of partitioning that out because there is, there are implications from a, a scalability standpoint as well, so, yeah. I think a lot of so, like the legumes, you know, in general, common legumes, a lot of them became available because they were easy to grow. You know, there's other legumes that actually do better in the fall, also. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, really spring, spring blooming legumes, for instance, you know. Yeah. Had better luck with bat tea, cream indigo, for instance. Yep. And if, if, whatnot. So, I, it's, it's all a matter of if you're really getting into the diversity of it, it seems to go more and more towards the fall. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, and that's, I think, what we found is that once you start adding, once you have a certain level of diversity, you're just, you pick that up. And so, because if you look at the actual seed, seeding rates, you know, there's more and more variation and there's, tends to be that on, on average it seems like a, any given species in the prairie flora prefers dormant seeding. I don't have data for that, but that's my thought. But, um, you know, when we look at a seed mix that the CRP planted, it's very limited flora, you know, that they're actually seeding. So you get these different uh, outcomes. Yeah. Actually, a couple comments earlier about frost seeding. Um, two different things. One is that we found, if you get your date right on frost seeding, it's way better uh, it, and it's very noticeable uh, if you get your date wrong it is way worse <laughs> it is you know so the the risk is there but um, we have a gentleman uh, who orders quite a bit for other farmers um, in southern Iowa northern Missouri and uh, but they do tons of switchgrass and he said that switchgrass is like twice twice as thick if you plant it frost seeding as opposed to spring and uh, also not quite as twice thick, but still a lot thicker than if you would dormant seed it. No idea why that is, don't know the science behind it, but just experience for some reason, if you get a frost seeding right, we've noticed it seems to be optimal. Couldn't tell you why. And, and then the other thing, and this opens a whole nother can of worms, is we uh, found that uh, about 12 years ago, we started drop seeding instead and that was all the difference, you know, because the corn is going to naturally would drop further in the ground because it's heavier, whereas milkweed seed doesn't, you know, doesn't weigh anything, so it's, it's going to go right on top. And, and so we started drop seeding with the Haro attachment. We found that seems to mimic Mother Nature the best, and that made a huge difference for us. And you're saying drop seeding between February versus March? Um, I... <laughs> 
uh, to define it. I, I've people have told us they're frost seeding as late as the like first week of March. We've had people tell it that they're going to frost seed, but again, it's all dependent on what the weather is doing more than so. Yeah, that is kind of I do kind of the first part of March I would include when I think about frost seeding. Have you looked at all yet, or do you know if anybody's planning to look at um, that time frame that nobody ever talks about, like <laughs> August through like mm -hmm. the end of October? So, so my predecessor, Dave Williams, did look at that in um, roadsides. And what, so what he found was that September is the worst time you could possibly plant, mm -hmm. at least in that study. Uh, October was, I think, and this is, I'm just recalling from my, from my head, I think we have this posted on the website somewhere, but if we don't, we should. Um, uh, October was more in line with uh, spring planting, and then that was as far as that study went. Um, I've had great success with Halloween plantings, but uh, <laughs> I've never tried to go earlier, mostly I think there's a lot of um, fear that we germinate our stuff too early, which I don't know, I would love to, to, has that happened to anybody? Yeah, and that's, I was then gonna follow up with, do you think that that's what happened with the September plantings? Is that things are germinating or, or, or did he elaborate at all? I think so, I think, I mean, just from a, you know, observationally, I definitely see a lot of seedlings come up in September when you, you know, that wet period in September that we typically you get, and it's at least warm enough that it seems like you get some stuff to come up. So that would be my guess. Uh, again, I'm just sort of speculating there, but don't have data yet. Thank you. <laughs>